Thanks, Mary. I thought I was safe hiding over there, but um, I knew eventually the call would come. How do you follow such magnificent speakers as Bassam and, and Susie? Um, I'm going to try. Uh, Susie, you said you're a, a simple non-geologist. That's a great statement, because I'm <laughs> used to saying I'm just a simple geologist. So now we're balanced. We're all simple here. Um, I'd like to address the issue of carbon capture and storage. And we, we know, we've talked about it, we've seen slides now, and one of the things that's really a, of an issue is our supply and demand of energy. The IEA, International Energy Agencies, the American Petroleum Institute, the American Association of Petroleum Geoscientists have made their projections of energy demand to the end of this century, in other words, till 2100. And they've also projected what kind of source we will have to meet those energy demands. Okay, obviously, energy demand is rising. What's going to meet those demands? Well, no matter what we do, no matter how much we try to introduce renewables, introduce nuclear, introduce all the really nice things that we want to do, we're going to be using at least 50% of our energy is going to come from fossil fuels, even at 2100. Okay? 50%. And that's the best we can do. Okay. That's not my statement. That's from those organizations. So that means that during that period of time, we're going to be generating a hell of, hell of a lot of greenhouse gases, predominantly CO2. You may have heard some of these terms. How many of you have heard the term clean coal technology? Yeah. What a great spin, huh? They had some really fantastic spin doctors, PR people, in the coal industry to come up with that one. I think it's fantastic. They've really got people thinking about it. What about low emissions technology? Yeah, we've heard of that one. Geo sequestration. Heard of that one? OK. Carbon capture and sequestration, yes. Carbon capture and storage, OK. CCS, well, same thing. Every one of these terms that we're talking about refers to the same thing, OK? These are different terms that are used around, but they all mean carbon capture and geological storage. You remember this slide? It's slightly different than the, the uh, slightly different colors than the ones that Bassam showed. But Basically, if you, if you didn't catch the drift of this one, this track projects out to 2050 what our emissions would be as business as usual, so basically about 62 gigatons. And these are what are called the wedges. These are the different technologies can be utilized to decrease the actual emissions. Okay, it looks like a nice little rainbow. The one I want to talk to you about is these uh, two wedges up here. The CCS, carbon capture and storage, uh, that's uh, applied to industrial processes. Okay, we always think of you know, uh, CO2 being generated by our uh, fossil fuel power plants. But don't forget that our mineral processing, our LNG plants, our cement producers, our iron and steel smelting, all produce CO2. OK, so that's the industry component. Transformation. Transformation refers to what Bassam was talking about, IGCC. In other words, transforming the coal to a gas and then burning that gas. OK, coal to liquids. Coal to gas is the transformation that we apply. So that's going to knock down, if we can do that, that's going to knock down our emissions by 9%. If we apply CCS to our power generation, our fossil fuel power generation, it's going to knock it down another 10%. So about 19, 20%. And you can see the rest of them, you know, the uh, nuclear renewables, etc. Whoops, let's go back. So. What is carbon capture and storage, or CCS? Well, basically, it starts with taking a uh, 
product that is burnt. That could be coal or gas, but it could also be the cements, the cement processing or gas processing. Okay? The most common one, though, and the one that most of us are used to is the uh, fossil fuel that's burnt in a power station. Well, that CO2 that's emitted from that power station can be captured and separated. And that technology exists today. Probably the best known technology for capture is what's used by the gas industry. The gas industry uses a solvent capture method. And basically what they do, because much of our gas, especially what comes from the Northwest Shelf, contains CO2, it needs to be separated anyway in order to produce the sales gas. That CO2 is stripped off, and at the present time, it's emitted to the atmosphere. Okay? What we'd like to do is to take that CO2 that's separated and capture it. Okay, the same sort of thing would be the case for the emissions from a power plant, a cement plant, and an aluminum smelter. Okay? We have those sorts of technologies. They'd be either solvents, they'd be membranes, and there's a whole bunch of these technologies out there. Which is the best? We don't know yet. I mean, this is still being worked on. We haven't been able to pick a winner. We don't know what's the most efficient, what's the cheapest. So there's a big issue there about which capture technology is going to be used. OK, let's say we get our capture house in order, and we're able to come up with a, the best capture mechanism. And maybe there'll be multiple uh, capture technologies different for di different um, uh, uh, generators. We then compress it. We compress that CO2. We compress it to a supercritical state. Okay? We do that fairly regularly as we speak. There's compression of gas. There's compression of CO2 going on pretty much everywhere where the oil and gas industry is working. So that's not rocket science. That's stuff that's happening. We compress it and we put it into a pipeline for transport. Okay, pipeline is the most efficient. Sometimes you want to put it into a tanker, you know, uh, in the compressed state. You know, the, the efficiencies there need to be um, worked through. Pipeline technology, transporting supercritical CO2 is not a big deal. There's about 4,500 kilometers of pipeline transporting supercritical CO2 in the USA today. Okay, what's it for? Well, they're using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So they're transporting the CO2 from the source to the, the oil fields where they inject it and they produce more oil with the uh, uh, injection of CO2. Okay, so compression, transport, they're not rocket science. We're doing it as is. What about the CO2 injection? Well, first thing we need to do is we have, need to find the right geological setting. What is the right geological setting? Well, those of us that are geologists know that what you need is you need a reservoir rock, okay? And then you need a seal rock, a reservoir rock. Well, how many of you think that oil and gas and that CO2 is gonna go into some great big cavern down there? <laughs> nah. What we're looking at is we're taking sedimentary rock with the pores, the spaces between the individual grains, okay? And we're gonna displace the saline brines that are in that space with the CO2. How do we know it's not gonna come up to the surface? Well, we put it someplace where there's a rock with very low porosity and low permeability, which we call a seal, something like a shale, okay? So we wanna make sure that we've got the right geological setting Oil and gas have been held in reservoir rocks contained by seal rocks for millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years. Is that long enough for us? <sighs> Probably. Okay, so we inject the CO2. Do we have the technology to inject CO2? You bet we do. As we speak, the oil and gas industry is injecting methane, injecting CO2, injecting water into the subsurface. Are we doing it safely? 
I like to think so. Don't talk to me about the Gulf of Mexico. That's a different issue. We can discuss that later. <laughs> you know, there are, there are issues. You know, I'm not going to knock those down. OK, so that's you know, really the basic principles. What happens to the CO2 once it's, it's down in the subsurface? And what does the subsurface mean? Well, remember I told you we're compressing the CO2 to be supercritical. Mother Nature is very kind to us. Because about a kilometer in depth, the temperatures and pressures are adequate to keep that CO2 in the supercritical state. Why do we want it supercritical? Well, because it takes up about 400 times less volume when it's supercritical rather than when it's in a gaseous state. So that's why we want to go supercritical, just space. Okay. So we want to find the right geology. We want to find the right depth. And then we also want to be able to monitor it, to make sure that we know what's happening to it. We know where it's going, that we can actually be sure of the safety issue. Well, that leads us to how do we do that? We need to put together some demonstration. Any project before you go commercial, you need to have some demonstration. And there are a bunch of demonstration projects in the world. There's about 160 various demonstration projects of CCS in the world. I'm only going to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in Australia. This, um, this slide shows you the major emission nodes where the main uh, greenhouse gas is CO2 predominantly is being emitted. Those are the little blue dots. And the pink or salmon colored area are the sedimentary basins where the geology is right for being able to put CO2 in, where we've got the sedimentary rocks, where we've got the porous and permeable reservoirs, where we've got shales that could be seals. Okay? Unfortunately, very many of our sources of CO2 are not immediately adjacent to those sedimentary basins, okay? which means we have to incur transport, which means we have to incur some additional cost there. Okay, so what are we doing with demonstration? Well, as you can see, there's quite a few demonstration projects already happening or planned to be happening in, in, um, in Australia. How many of you have heard of the Gorgon Project? Okay, the Gorgon Project is going to be the world's largest uh, carbon capture and uh, storage uh, demonstration project. Okay? But you probably don't know that there's one already in existence, the only one of its kind in Australia, which is the Otway project. It's just a little project. The CO2 CRC is putting away 60,000 tons of CO2 just to be able to demonstrate that we can, just to be able to demonstrate that we can monitor it, just to be able to say that it's safe, and just to be able to work with regulators to get some sort of framework of a regulatory regime. Okay. It's also to make sure that we, as the uh, community, become comfortable with this technology. That it's not something way out there, someday going to happen, but it's actually happening now. OK, let me summarize with just a few key points for you. OK, first off, as we've heard, the global response to climate change is going to include a whole range of mitigation measures, and this is going to include greater energy efficiency, more renewables, lower carbon fuels switch to gas, and CCS. There's no silver bullet. We don't have a single answer to this thing. That's why those wedges are there. We are going to continue to use fossil fuels, so we better do it in cleaner and smarter ways. CCS is really one of our best options that we have at present for doing this. It's a place saver. It's a step in the process until we no longer have to use fossil fuels. But as long as we do, we better do something with that amount of CO2 that's being emitted. CCS demonstrations like the ones I showed you in Australia are going to provide us with the confidence that CCS is technically feasible this is what's going to accelerate its technical deployment. Let's not forget something here. We're talking about commercial deployment. Commercial deployment will only happen if there's a viable carbon price. 
No carbon price, you're not going to get CCS in a commercial setting. Commercial deployment of CCS will foster an industry equal in size or larger than the present oil and gas industry. Let, let me repeat that for you. Let me repeat that for you, just in case you missed that. If we are able to deploy CCS, it's going to generate a, an industry equal in size or larger than the present-day oil and gas industry. The present-day oil and gas industry, the infrastructure has been developed for about 100 some odd years. Okay, how long has that taken? Do we have that kind of time to develop the infrastructure from C for CCS? If we get the deployment, and my students love this slide, any of you here students still? Fantastic, you're all students. In an academic institution at the moment, not the school of life, which, which we're all part of. Okay, CCS as a future, it's gonna require skills Skills in engineering, skills in geoscience, skills in economics, legal, regulatory. So it's going to offer a whole range of broad career opportunities. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that, leave you ponder with, with that last thought. So thanks. Thanks, John. The microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing too hard, I'm close enough to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a, prov a particularly provocative statement was that by 2100, we'd still be burning, we're getting 50% of our energy from fossil fuels. Yes. And, and you know, that, that is based on authoritative assessments from organisations such as the International Energy Agency. But let me, let me lay out a, a short chain of logic to you and then get your response on this. That the reason that they say that is that the cheapest form of energy is fossil fuels. Would you agree? Um, I'm not sure why they say that, but I'll, I'll okay, take that, okay? Okay, because coal is cheap. Yep. And so coal can continue to be, and it's abundant, so it can continue to be a mainstay of our energy. But then if we consider CCS, it axiomatically must be more expensive than today's coal technology, is that right? Because you're gonna burn more coal yep. to generate the energy to, to compress and store. You're going to have to have a more complex plant to do it. Okay, so all, all of this suggests that coal plus CCS will be more expensive. So then it begs the question that CCS will never work without a carbon price. Is that right? Correct. And that's got to be a carbon price that, that is essentially operating globally because if it doesn't op operate globally, then places that don't have a carbon price won't bother with CCS. Do you agree with that logic? No, no, I don't. Because if you look at Norway, Norway has a carbon tax and all the producers, the gas producers in Norway are having to sequester their CO2 or pay the carbon tax. Is that for baseload electricity generation? Um, no, because no. most of their baseload is coming out of uh, hydro. Hydro, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. for countries that rely on coal for their electricity generation, which ultimately is their, their fundamental economic drivers, are they going to ever do CCS without a carbon price? No, they, they won't. And, and probably not no, without a global carbon price. There's places like China and so on. That's right. so, so the question is, will we have that situation where we get to 50% fossil fuels by 2100 if fossil fuels don't remain cheap? And they won't remain cheap if we have to use CCS. Or is it more likely that alternative technologies such as nuclear or renewables could actually mm -hmm. gazump that whole projection because of the fact that we know axiomatically that CCS is coal plus a cost. Sure. Oh, you're absolutely right, Barry. And, you know, the market's going to decide. Mm. The market is going to be the deciding uh, factor there. Um, let me just add one thing just to make sure that everyone is clear on this, is that if you've got a, a power plant, you're going to have to not only generate the power to... Uh, make your electricity, but you're also going to have to generate a certain amount of extra power, about 25 percent, to compress, transport, capture the uh, CO2. Okay, so that means for every three power plants, you're going to need a fourth one for CCS. I mean, that's that's a fact. But what we're talking about now is the net CO2 reduction. Okay. 
Let's say you do all that, you still are left with a net reduction of the emissions. What does it cost? Well, that's the issue. Can we continue with our, uh, our fossil fuel use with CO2 abatement, the CCS, or will some other technology surpass it? And that's what I'm reading okay. that the market. So, so is it your judgment that a carbon price sufficiently high to make CCS competitive with current fossil fuels would still be more competitive than other alternatives to CCS? such as nuclear or wind or solar thermal, geothermal? Well, look, I'd love to see those numbers <laughs> because there are those numbers around. Many of you have probably seen it. And I guess it's very, very often a case-specific thing. So it seems like yeah. we, we can reach a logical conclusion that CCS will only be deployed in a large scale, putting aside technical issues, mm -hmm. if CCS still remains cheaper sure. than the alternatives once carbon price. Absolutely. Okay, so that's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, sorry. I think there is another um, uh, twist in the tail, if you like, in that it could be regulated. It doesn't need a price. The government could say, well, no new coal power unless you have CCS, unless you have CCS. And so then if it becomes a policy regulation, mm -hmm. then it doesn't have a direct carbon price, it has an indirect, indirect carbon, carbon price. price. Yeah. That's, that's right. And, and these things are, are probable, and that's some of the things that industry are weighing up in terms of do you take a carbon price and then you pick the lowest technology or do you wait for the government to, to regulate and say you will do this? And interestingly, that's an option that people like James Hansen, who's a climatologist, pushing for really strict carbon emissions and specifically a phase out of coal completely by 2030. And so I asked Bassam the question of, you know, is that possible? And he said there's a 0% chance of that. What Hansen is arguing is that you should never build another coal-fired power station without having it operating on CCS already. And so the, the question then becomes, would we be able to replace our entire coal fleet in 20 years no. with CCS? It's not going to happen. No, as most of our coal-fired plants are built for 30 to 50 years. I mean, they say 20, but it's, you know, there are many around, most of them around are over 30 years old and they're still running and they're being revamped rather than rebuilt. So most of the operators are not going to tear it down so that's one of the issues. So you're going to have to retrofit your CCS on existing power plants, which is more expensive. Uh, the average uh, efficiency of power, coal power plants in the world is 26%. Mm -hmm. and as I've shown, we could actually run it at roughly 50%. Sure. So we could cut our emission by half if we replace the sure. current power stations with actually efficient ones in the first place. That's right. Uh, but what, what Barry was sort of, you know, the scenario Barry was talking about is, is is actually a, a disaster in a sense because these the most polluting power stations in the world, coal power station actually is in Australia, we hold the record, and then this would going to be running and renovated and just keep running and more and more and yeah. more. I mean, this should not be allowed mm -hmm. to continue. And talking about the efficiencies, you know, as I mentioned, that at the moment you're looking at a 25% penalty, but those efficiencies are increasing as well. So we may be dropping those 25% penalties down to 2018, whatever. So you know, you're always developing the technologies to increase your efficiencies. All right, putting your prognostication hat on, if, if, if a, a country really, really wanted to do CCS for various reasons, what's the earliest date in which they could really start to do this commercially? On a large scale, you know, enough to say, start Next coal-fired power station they build is a CCS power uh, station. Pick a country because, I mean, it's different for different countries. All right, how about Australia? Pick Australia. <laughs> well, as soon as we get either the price signal or the regulatory signal, it can happen because we do have already the demonstration plants going. Okay? Can we turn them into commercial? Sure. How long will it take? Probably 10 to 20 years. So in, in today's dollar terms, what would the price signal have? What's the differential between current coal, such as I, I, ICG, yeah. IGCC or, um, or CCS? Well, okay, this is where we get into the, the real nitty gritty of it because it's number one, site specific, you know, plant specific. If you take the, the average worldwide, and this is a di discussion that Barry and I were having before, if you take a, you know, average worldwide price, it's 60 to 70 bucks a ton of CO2 avoided, okay? However, 
if you're at a place where your power plant is old, it's inefficient, you don't have the, uh, the place to build the, or add on the uh, capture technology, it's going to cost you more. If the power plant is at a place where you don't have good geology, you're going to have to transport it a distance, which is going to cost you more. So it's very, very much of a site-specific issue. So whereas I can give you a worldwide average, that worldwide average may be close or not close to what it would be for the particular plant, let's say, in Monmora or Loyang. That's where one of the problems comes in if you just regulate, because you're putting the same regulation on two plants, yep. uh, but the cost for one is going to significantly outweigh the other. Whereas if it was a simple carbon price, then they could choose whether they want to invest in forestry or they wanted to purchase yep. solar or whatever else to, op to, to manage their own portfolio within that space. Big and up. you talk about that lowest cost reduction. Yeah. So John, how meaningful is the term, you talked about spin terms before, the term CCS ready. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> well, that's right. Well, capture ready means that, hey, in this power plant, I've, I've left a footprint where I could put some sort of, you know, either membrane or solvent or cryogenic uh, capture device. So that's all it means. I've, I've got a footprint. So when you hear a capture ready power plant, that's all it means. Okay, CCS ready, they usually say that, but they mean it's capture ready because they've put that footprint there. In order to be truly CCS ready, they've got to be able to have a storage. There's no CCS without the S, you know, which means you've got to do the geology, you've got to do the exploration the same way that our industry, our oil and gas and our resources industry is exploring for resources. In this case, the resources is that pore space. So you've got to have that pore space explored for, you've got to have the right geology, and you need to be able to have that combined with your capture technology in your specific power plant that you're talking about. Okay, here's a final question just on your point before we um, look at some of the other speakers again. There's a lot of resistance to CCS and electricity generation. People say it's not ever going to be economic, we can't scale up and so on. But can you see other roles for CCS that we're going to have to do anyway, even if we don't use it for electricity generation? If we want to have essentially a zero carbon economy, where do you think CCS might fill a nice niche role? Well, the, the low-hanging fruit, okay, the, the LNG plants, the gas separation plants, because you're already separating it. That's your low-hanging fruit. The other low-hanging fruit, the cement industry. They're pretty much putting out a pure stream CO2. Okay, one of the big costs is that most of our power plants put out a stream that's mainly nitrogen, 80 to 85 percent nitrogen and uh, 15 to 20 percent CO2. So you've got to capture and concentrate that. With the uh, two low-hanging fruit uh, scenarios that I just mentioned, the natural gas industry already separates it to get sales gas and the cement industry has it coming out pretty much as pure stream CO2. So those, those are the ones where I'd start with. And I should note, there's a third one I can think of, that often biomass is touted as a potential further baseload renewable yeah. substitute. Ideally, what you'd want to do is build a biomass thermal power plant that also captures carbon dioxide. Again, it becomes a negative emitter. You're actually drawing in CO2 from the atmosphere to grow the plants, and then you're sequestering it geologically. Potentially, you can actually use that as a drawdown mechanism, and that's a kind yeah. of attractive um, proposition for CCS in the future. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'd sure like to see that.